Well, good morning, Church of the Valley. Hey, that was pretty good. All right. My name is Chris, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and I'm privileged to bring the Word of God this morning. I'm very excited about this passage. I'm excited to be here with you. And, you know, people say that. Like, I actually mean that, you know. It's just not one of those things. So I just, just that disclaimer there. And so uh, we're going to get into the Word. But before we do, I want to give you some context, because if you've been following along with us in our series in the book of Acts, or maybe if you're uh, just here for the first time during the series this morning, we haven't seen Peter in a while. And so it's been a few chapters. In fact, the last time we saw Peter was back in Acts 8, uh, it was uh, verses 9 through 25. And you have this, this sort of situation where you, you enter in a man named Simon, who's a sorcerer, uh, and he seems to have done really well for himself. He's, he's seen kind of to have the power of the gods, uh, small g. And, and then uh, uh, Peter and John, they, they come and preach. It seems that uh, God draws Simon, uh, that he receives Jesus Christ as Lord. Uh, but then what he sees is he sees Peter like laying hands on people and the Holy Spirit coming and his sorcerer radar kicks in and he wants to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. He actually wants to purchase that power so that can be used. And in Acts chapter 8, in verse 20, we see Peter's really strong rebuke of Simon. It it, it says in God's word, in Acts chapter 8, verse 20, Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such thoughts in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Not a very seeker-sensitive message. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And so we see the situation, and then it kind of moves on. It moves to different, different uh, instruments of God, different uh, disciples and, and situations. We see the drawing of Saul, who would become Paul. And then we get to this text today where some really miraculous things happen. And we might be tempted to say, wow, this is cool. Uh, people are healed, the dead are raised, and then we kind of move on. Because let's be honest, in Acts, this kind of stuff is happening regularly. But really, even in this short portion of Scripture in the book of Acts, there is so much here that we are blessed to take a look at. This text, like every text of Scripture, has something to say to us all because I think we can see the author of life is shaping our lives in every way to point us either to a closer walk with him or a brand new one. This text is about the gospel. And listen, God deeply cares about the eternal destiny of people, of all people, but also the earthly circumstances of our lives. But those things always must be viewed through the lens of the gospel. Getting to our text today, I want to give you kind of some some, some geography, if you will, to this. So there's a map that I want to show you really quick. So here's a map, and, and whether you can see or not, uh, here's kind of some of the, the areas that we're going to cover today, at least one right there. You'll see Lita kind of like right in the middle almost of that map. And so the reason I want to show you that is in Acts chapter 8, there's not a reference up there for that, but in Acts chapter 8, verses 28 through 40, we see Philip. We, we see Philip, and we kind of see his journey tracking there. And the reason I show you that is, is Philip's journey starts at Azotus, Kind of, kind of down towards the left, and then goes up to Caesarea. And the reason I show you that is many scholars think that Philip was the one to first bring the gospel to Leda. Now, we have nothing to tell us that for sure. And honestly, if he didn't, if he didn't preach first there, no big deal. Either way, all we know is as we get to a text like we're in today, that it's the church that Peter is visiting and, and so I just kind of want to give you that background as we get into the text today. Years ago, uh, Tanya and I were invited by some friends of ours where we lived first in Ohio uh, to come over to their home. 
And the reason they wanted us to visit their home is they, they knew that we were Christians, that we believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he rose again, that he's reigning on high. And these two people, Jeff and Ellen, I'm going to give you their names, are not in Christ. And what they wanted us to do is they wanted us to come over to their home to have a conversation specifically about Christianity. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a situation like this, but from a Christian point of view, what they were saying to us, witness to us. Tell us about Jesus. They wanted to ask us questions about the Bible, about how we reconcile all of these different things as it relates to God and what is happening in the world. And, and, and they were just asking some tough questions to us, and we were just responding back the best way we could. Now, I say that to you to say, to this day, they have not received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, neither one of them. But I also say this to you to say that Ella has known my wife, Tanya, for years because Ella and Tanya grew up in Ukraine. And Ella, as a non-believer, is from the East. And if you know what is happening in Ukraine, the East has been in war since 2014. And so I tell this to tell you, like, she's approaching what is happening right now in Ukraine as a non-believer with, 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 with not a lot of hope. I tell you, tell you this to say that, that we are still very much struggling with what is happening in Ukraine right now. And we're struggling as those who believe the gospel, have not lost our hope in God, know the eternal destiny of those who've received Jesus Christ as Lord. But I'm going to come back to Jeff and Ella later to share a little bit more about them. But as we come to a text like today, I know this that the author of life is shaping our lives in every way to point us either to a closer walk with God or a brand new one. And that's how he's using this in Tanya and I's lives right now. Verse 32. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Leda. Now this term, the Lord's people, in the ESV would say the saints what, what the scripture is just trying to make clear here is that these are the people of God. Peter is going to visit the church. Now, uh, just for geographical reference, this place, Lida, is what is near uh, the international airport that exists today in Israel of Lod. So that just kind of gives you a little bit of background. It's very, very close to this site. So again, going to the map now, we're going to see that right now. So there is Lida, right there. And it's all this kind of area that we're covering is kind of in the Valley of Sharon right there. And so that's what we're looking at right now. That's where they are in this instance. The Holy Spirit is guiding people, guiding Peter specifically to Leda. And the Holy Spirit, we can't discount the work that he is doing in this whole situation. One of the things that we do with our oldest son, Matthew, at home is, is something called New City Catechism. And so if you're familiar all with catechism, it's, it's, there are these theological questions and answers and then scripture verses that go along with it. Now, we're not doing this so that Matthew can, can say, look at me and I have these things all memorized. We're not doing it so this somehow justifies Matthew before God, but it's a, a good practice for him to, to get at the deep theological things of scripture. And his most recent question is this, how does the Holy Spirit help us? The answer to that question is this. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, comforts us, guides us, gives us spiritual gifts and the desire to obey God. And he enables us to pray and understand God's words. So we see as Peter is going to Lido, we would say the Holy Spirit is guiding Peter to this area where there's going to be some great miracles, but that's not the point, folks. Here at Church of the Valley, we see people exercising their spiritual gifts on a regular basis to obey God. On Easter weekend, it, it was like almost a week-long event. It, on Thursday night, many of us gathered in the fellowship hall to, to stuff eggs, to get eggs ready for our Easter egg hunt that was for our people and for the community. And there were many people involved in that. On Friday night, we, we gathered here 
on Good Friday, and there were multiple different people reading scriptures and leading us in a time of song and worship and, and participating in that. On Saturday, we had our Easter egg hunt based around the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and, and people came, and they were invited to stay, and most of the people did stay. And we got to celebrate with the kids. Uh, we got to, to, to fellowship one an- with one another. And it was an amazing thing. And on Sunday, there were just so many participating in our worship on Sunday morning, whether it was those preaching, whether it was those teaching in children's. Our own children's ministry director on Easter Sunday did not have to work in children's ministry because so many people stepped up to help. Now, our children's ministry director loves working with the kids. And, and so it's not like if she would have had to have been with them, they would have been like, oh, well, I never get to go in worship service. She would have loved that. But the fact that so many of you stepped up to do that, it's an amazing thing. The Holy Spirit is guiding you to serve in so many different ways. Keep it up, COV. Keep serving. It's a wonderful thing. That Holy Spirit that led Peter to lead a is the same Holy Spirit that lives in you if you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Verse 33. There he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for years. Now, likely for eight years. He was not born this way. And likely he's an adult because the qualification there is that uh, this had happened and had been for a period of eight years. We don't know how it happened, and so we don't really need to linger on that. Uh, In Acts 3, we see a lame man that was healed, and we were told he was lame from birth, but in this instance, he's just had it for eight years. And then there's this kind of meetup. We don't see any sort of formal request, like, Peter, can you come and see this guy? Uh, That could have happened, but we just don't know that for sure. Uh, We do know that the Holy Spirit was guiding Peter to that. The point is that Jesus Christ is working in this individual, and he, he was about to benefit greatly from this. And then we see this amazing instance in verse 34. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat, and immediately Aeneas got up. Don't miss the fact that Peter said, Jesus Christ heals you. Peter did not say, I'm going to take care of this. Get on up. Now, maybe that's how he said it. I don't know for sure. He might have been just a little more animated. We don't know that. But he didn't say, I got you taken care of. If he said that, maybe the guy wouldn't be healed. We don't know. We know that up to this point, the Holy Spirit is working mightily through this man who had misstepped a lot. Like we know this is the guy who denied Jesus three times, who, who, who just kind of got a little bit ahead of himself, cut off the ear of someone who came to arrest Jesus. And basically Jesus said, stop it. And healed the guy. But at this point, the Holy Spirit is working through Peter, and Peter's not willing to take any credit. He says, Jesus Christ heals you. And what we see here is that God deeply cares not only about the eternal destiny of people, but the earthly circumstances of our lives viewed through the lens of the gospel. We see that because the eternal nature of what's about to happen as a result of this miracle is important, but this guy gets to walk again. That's an amazing thing. Verse 35. All of those who lived in Leda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Listen, the physical healing was great, but this is a lot better, folks. I keep wanting to walk over here. My water bottle's in the way, so. This is just so much better. Now, now, there's all kinds of debate around what does all mean in this situation. Uh, there are scholars that wonder, is Luke using some sort of play on words, and it wasn't really like all of the people there? Is there some sort of a discrepancy there where we're not like every single person came to the Lord? Uh, I'm just going to go with all. If God can part the Red Sea, 
and, and his people can walk across on dry land, Old Testament reference to you. I, I'm pretty sure all people can be drawn to God. It, it, if God can send his son to die on the cross for the sins and take on the sins of not just like one or two people, but the whole world, everybody who's ever lived and ever will live, and, and raise him from the dead, uh, take him back up to heaven, he can save all people. Either way, if, if you're just going to say a few people, like if it just one person came to Christ as a result of this, this is still great, but it's still much more significant than the physical healing of Aeneas. I'm going to say all means all. And what we see here, once again, is that the author of life, meaning God created it in the first place, life itself, is shaping our lives in every way to either point us to a closer walk with him or a brand new one. The gospel is the point here, not the physical healing. The drawing of people to God was so much better. It's so much greater. If we were to just stop at verse 34 and skip over verse 35... We're doing a disservice to what God is really trying to communicate here. That people were drawn to God. That sins were forgiven. That they believed on the Lord Jesus and they were saved. It's a wonderful thing. And then we get kind of this new situation that comes up after this miracle has happened. I'm going to show you the map again. It should be on there next. Okay, so they're in Lida, and then he's going to go to Joppa, all right? So let's read uh, in verse 36 once again. In Joppa, there was a man named Tabitha, there was a disciple, excuse me, it's not a man, disciple named Tabitha, in Greek her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. I just want to say, uh, if you're here and your name is Dorcas or you have a family member who's named Dorcas, I, I applaud your parents for their creativity. And it is a biblical name, and, and we see that, and we, and we do that, and that's all I'm going to say about that right now. But we see just kind of this interchangeably, uh, her name being used here. And, and the reason I show you the map is what we know about that is, is this is kind of a port city. It, it's modern Jaffa or Jaffa. It's just south of Tel Aviv, which is probably an area you're familiar with or you've heard about. Um, and, and what we know is this is, this is about a three-hour walk. So it was, it was near. And, and, and here's what else we know about her. She was living the gospel out. And we know that, 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 that the, the scripture wants to communicate that she's in Christ because of using the term disciple here. The, the, the term disciple here, it, it, it's, it's a term that's, that's relegated to her only in the New Testament. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, the term in the Greek is mat, mathetria. And it's the only time that the word disciple is used in its feminine form in Greek. It's the only time it's referred to for a woman in the New Testament. Now, it's not trying to communicate that she's the only disciple of Christ that's a woman. It's just trying to make it clear that, that she is a disciple of Christ. And it says, she was full of good works and charity in the ESV, but it just says here that she's always doing good and helping the poor. Always, meaning, I'm going to say, Always, Eugene, right? She, she had a great reputation. She was, she was loving her neighbor. In, in fact, the great commandment is something we find in Matthew chapter 22. Uh, uh, Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And, and, and it says in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 39, this Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, she's living this out. It says she's always doing good and helping the poor. Goodness, isn't that something you want said about you? Not so people can look at you and say, oh, look at how much they do but so that that can point to God and how much God can work in a person. 
And she was doing it as a result of the gospel, the gospel that had saved her. It's clearly stated that she is a disciple of Christ. All of those reasons that we serve, all of those things that I covered, whether you sing on worship team in our new choir, whether you help in tech ministry, you serve in children's ministry, whether you work in youth or you lead a cohort, or you participate in any of those things, none of those things justify you, but they're an overflow of what God has already done in your life. I can't imagine my life without the Lord. I really can't. First of all, I'd be out of a job. If I didn't have Christ, I have no business being up here. And frankly, I'm not good at anything else. I don't really think I'm very good at this. It's the Holy Spirit in me. But one thing that Tim Riley, our lead pastor, routinely says, for us, we get paid to be Christians. And honestly, we have an amazing staff here. It is a privilege to co-labor with these people. I I love being around them, especially if they've had their coffee. (laughs) But not only that, like, I'm excited that I get to share the stage today with the Neeflings. We are blessed with uh, just a wide range of talents, giftedness to be up here. It's just an amazing fellowship to be a part of. And imagine the kind of affection for a person like Tabitha, who was always doing good and serving the poor. Now, contextually, what we're going to see in a moment is that probably a lot of this service was directed at the widows in this this church. But I wonder, like, how would she be remembered today, right? Right? What would be tweeted about her? What kind of Instagram posts would go up? What kind of TikTok videos would be done to commemorate Tabitha? A pastor in kind of the Philadelphia area, Eric Mason, had this to say in his book, Unleashed. Our entire spiritual life as disciples is the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, progressively making the Savior known to us. In light of this, our goal in life must center around the goal of the Spirit, to know the truth and Jesus more intimately by faith. And as the Spirit leads us into this deeper intimacy, it will not be us for us to just revel in the divine presence, but to be motivated for a great commitment to the gospel mission in the world. And we get the pleasure of at least knowing how that was playing out in Tabitha's life. Again, we're told that she did good and helped the poor. Listen, the people of God will and should care about the whole person, the spiritual and the physical. And and here's kind of my unashamed plug for you to sign up to help Valley Village here in a couple weeks. It's an opportunity to serve. It's an opportunity to go and stain some fences that need to be stained. And Mike's going to talk about that in the announcements. It's just, it's just an opportunity to care for them. And, and listen, in my life, I've known people, and, and maybe you've known people that are just uniquely gifted to care for the poor or the needy or the widows. In fact, all the way back in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, uh, which is a, a, a long book of rebuke towards the people of God, They've they've turned away from God. They're not doing what they should. Uh, They're getting petered in this moment. They're they're getting rebuked, like like Simon rebuked, but then there's this whole nation of people that's going, you are not doing it right. But it's not more than that. You're just, like, you're not getting at the heart of God. You're not seeking him. And and so there's this series of rebukes in the first kind of 15, 16 verses And then there's this turn and say, look, here's what you really need to do in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. Years ago, uh, I was working as an intern at a church in student ministry. And I was working alongside another guy by the name of Trevor. And 
Trevor just had this way of seeing people that I didn't at the time, and I'm still working on it. And here's what I mean by that. We were, uh, I don't even remember what, shopping for what. Uh, we were shopping for something for student ministry, most likely water balloons or, uh, I don't know, uh, cheese balls or something like that. And we were at Walmart, and uh, we were there picking up stuff. And I, I wasn't even aware of what was happening, but there was a lady in front of us in line, and, and she was buying stuff, and she didn't have enough money. And I'm noticing this all after the fact, so, so what Trevor did is, is he saw this lady uh, take a pair of shoes and say, I'm, I'm, well, I'm not going to get these because I can't afford them, but the shoes were for her kids. And so Trevor just took out his wallet and he paid for those shoes. And, and I wasn't like, oh, she probably has money. She's not, like, I just didn't notice until it all happened and then everything clicked afterwards. I don't know if this next instance was before or after that situation, but uh, we had picked up these uh, gigantic sub sandwiches for a, a youth leader meeting that we had. Uh, we were the interns, so we did everything that the youth pastor didn't want to do, and so uh, we went to go shopping and stuff like that, and so we went to go pick up the food, and I'm driving, and Trevor says, I need you to pull over, pull over, this guy over here. I, I didn't even see the guy. There's a guy on the corner with the sign uh, begging for money or help in any way. And, and so what Trevor does is he grabs some of those sandwiches and he says, he, he gives them to the guy. And I'm like, I had not even noticed the guy. The, my problem is, I'm a point A to point B person. And so, hear me now. If you're in the sanctuary and, and I walk right by you to greet somebody else, it's not because I think you smell. <laughs> I just have seen somebody and I'm headed for that somebody, and I'm getting to that somebody. When you walk with a family of five with two four-year-olds and a puppy, and they stop everywhere, and you're like, I want to get around, the like, it, pray for me. Because <laughs> I'm going for a walk today with that crew. I just don't always see like I need to. I need to notice, we need to notice more the needs around us. Like Tabitha. Verses 37 and 38. About that time, she became sick and died. Her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. And Lita was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lita, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Now remember, this is about three hours we know that if he was a runner, maybe it was quicker, right? We don't know that. But it just at a regular pace walk, what we know is it's about a three-hour walk. And we also see that there's some urgency in their request to Peter. It, it, says, it says not only come, but come at once. It says, the text here says they urged him to come. They knew what the Holy Spirit was doing. These are, again, remember, the people of God. They're hearing the rumors. Because remember, I believe with all of my heart that God deeply cares about the eternal destiny of people and the earthly circumstances of our lives. But again, we view all of that through the lens of the gospel. Verse 39, Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room, and all the widows stood around him, crying and showing the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Now, you've, you've probably been at some sort of memorial service, some sort of funeral, a viewing maybe, and, and very often at these services, what you'll see or what you'll have are keepsakes, right? Uh, a blanket that the person knits. A Bible that was their Bible. Maybe a hat. Maybe a poster. Some sort of keepsake that not only uh, helps you to remember that person, but they may be made for you. And that's what's happening here. This is where we get when she's uh, you know, always serving and caring for the poor. It's the widows that are there saying, look, here's what she made for me. 
and they're grieving. They're having a hard time with this, but there's still an expectancy of what might happen. Verse 40. Peter sent them all out of the room, and then he got down on his knees and prayed, turning toward the dead woman. He said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up, verse 41. He took her by the hand, helped her to her feet, and then he called for the other believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. Now, some things are made crazy crystal clear to us in this text. She was dead. And she did rise from the dead. This eliminates the speculation around this text. At least for us it should. There's there's no sort of ambiguity here. This is before the era of fake news. It wasn't like, okay, well maybe she passed out. You know, Maybe she was just dog-tired because her coffee wasn't strong enough at Pete's. And we just couldn't wake her. No, she, she had passed. There was a service. There were keepsakes. God, the Holy Spirit, through, through Luke, and Peter said, like, he's looking at a person who had died. It's clear. She was dead. She came back to life. This might sound a little bit familiar to you. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is saying to the church at Corinth, at first, I delivered to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he says this in verses 5 through 8, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Not only did she rise from the dead, Peter said, here she is. She's alive. She is presented to them alive. Now, now, she wasn't dead for three days and then raised to life like Jesus, but like being dead and then being not dead, that's a big deal, right? That's not normal. Here's the thing, COV. Our faith is not built on myths, legends, or bedtime stories. It is rooted in the factual person and work of Jesus Christ and totally dependent on him. And that work is what brought her back to life. But the end result of what happens here is not just, yay, she's alive, because one day there was going to be another memorial and, and she didn't come back. But that it results in the salvation of souls and God saying to people, your sins are forgiven through the work of Jesus Christ. Verse 42, this became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. It's not just saying, I believe there is a God. It, it, it is, what it's trying to communicate here is, Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. He rose again. He is my Lord. Sins are forgiven. People are saved. That's the point. Because, listen, the miracles of God are meant to draw people to him. They just are. Modern day so-called faith healers miss it because it points to an individual with a gift, a movement that is miraculous, but doesn't point to the God who wants to save souls. The author of life is shaping our lives in every way to point us either to a closer walk with him or a brand new one. And then we get verse 43. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. When I first read that text, I'm like, okay, let's just move on, right? You got these miraculous healings, lots of people coming into Christ, and then this. And at first, when I got the assigned text from Tim, I'm like, man, come on. 
But this is significant in and of itself. He hung back with a tanner. Now, now what this is, is this is working with animal hides to make a kind of leather. And, and the thing of this is, is that many of the animals that this tanner was working with would have been seen as like ceremonial unclean by, by the Jewish community. And so this is just another way for God to communicate, look, I'm breaking these barriers, like the gospel is for this guy. Let's not, let's not put distance between you and a tanner. This is the Seahawks fan breaking bread with a 49ers fan. <laughs> I know I heard gasps. <laughs> the gospel can make it so. <laughs> like, like, it's not a throwaway verse, folks. God is drawing people to himself. He's staying with a specific guy, and the Holy Spirit through Luke wants to make sure, hey, I said the gospel is for all. Now here's, what I'm, here, here's where I'm going to show that again. Here's some things about me. I don't own a house. It's not in the cards right now. We, we're able to rent a beautiful house in San, San Jose, and, and we love it. But everybody here knows, whether you own a house or not, Crazy expensive. You know, it's just, it, 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 that's the thing. Look, I, I don't know how to work on cars. I just don't. Like, my dad showed me some things growing up, but I was the kid who was like, I really want to be doing something else right now. I want to go play Nintendo. I'm going to hunt some ducks. Please, can I do that instead? But my dad made me do it, so I didn't pay attention. I don't expect to ever have a full head of hair again. I just don't. I just don't. It's not happening. I can't speak one language well, let alone the three that my wife speaks fluently. I don't cheer for the most popular sports team in this area. Go Denver Broncos. Yeah, I knew I'd get that. I don't always do what I should, and I sometimes avoid doing the right thing and too often do the things that I shouldn't. It's like, I frustrate myself. I don't consider myself particularly extraordinary in any way. But I do know that Jesus died on a cross for my sins. I do know that he rose again. I do know that he's reigning and ruling on high, and he's not just relegated to a book. And I do know that the author of life is shaping our lives in every way to point us either to a closer walk with him or a brand new one. I'm going to ask Dan and Melanie to come up now. Because I also know something else. I know that God deeply cares about the eternal destiny of people and the earthly circumstances of our lives. But I know that all of that must be viewed through the lens of the gospel. And as I think about the lens of the gospel, I think about Jeff and Ella, who have not yet received Jesus Christ as Lord. As hard as a time was we're having with what is happening in Ukraine, they're viewing it through just hopelessness without God. So as we pray, I'm going to pray for them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you right now and I pray for Jeff and Ella. God, I pray that you would draw them to yourself. I pray that their little girl someday could say, Jesus Christ, you are my Lord. And I pray for them and their family who've been able to make it from Ukraine, that you would do the same for them and draw them to yourself. And God, I pray for Ukraine. I pray for the war to end. I do pray for military victory for Ukraine so that the war could end, that there would be peace. But I, but I also pray for us in our lives that, that, that we would understand just the absolute beauty of a text like this and how you, how you have drawn people to yourself as a result of what you have done. And I pray that we don't get so stuck on the miracles that happen here that we miss the reality of salvation. And God, I pray for us as we're here in this wonderful area that has so much to offer 
And when we go to Great America or we go to parks with our kids or we go to Pete's or we go to Starbucks, that we don't focus so much on those things that we miss the reality that you want to use us to draw people to yourself. Guide us now as we continue to worship you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.